Right, you ready? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, right. Game face. Yeah, no, I've got nothing. No, okay. <laughs> Obviously, I've got something. Um, good morning. Um, we're all looking a bit bleary-eyed because it's a bit early. Um, Coping mechanisms, obviously, uh, you know, the keys in the title of the podcast, 50 and coping with a question mark. Um, a coping mechanism that is really useful, but yet pretty obvious, is music. Music is something that is in all of our lives, inescapably. Um, whether it's a conscious decision to listen to music or it is ambience in music in places you go to. But there are certain songs that can trigger some memories. Um, they can trigger emotions. They can trigger you to feel happy or even sad. So Lee and I are going to talk today about the importance of music in our lives and hopefully in yours too. Morning. Morning. Are you good? I'm very good today, yes. Good. Cold, but good other than it that. It is a bit cold, but that'll be winter for you. Aye. Right. Where, where are we going with this? What's happening? Well, I guess the, the, the embryo of doing this as a pod came from my thoughts uh, about an experience I had about a particular song. So um, I've done a bit of breath work as a, as a, loose, uh, a loose statement, Wim Hof breathing stuff. Okay. Which hopefully we'll get Dan, a guy I know that, that is a Wim Hof coach on at some so point, to talk it, about all that. So can you talk a little bit about what it is? What is breathwork? Um, okay, so breathwork as a concept is using breathing to uh, affect your mental state in terms of stress and stuff. So there's various breathing exercises mm -hmm. that you can do to bring yourself down. Mm. A lot of it is about the sympathetic and parasympathetic sympathetic nervous systems. And the, the thing that I think it was the simplest way it was explained to me is when you think if you have a stressful event, like a car crash, or you see something scary happen, yep. you'll go, <gasps> right? right? And then when you get home after your car crash, you sit in the chair and you go, <sighs> those two things, the <gasps> is the sympathetic nervous system kicking in, the fight or flight or freeze, all that stuff. Yep. Parasympathetic is a, <sighs> it's the feeling relaxed and calm oh, okay. and warm and away from the saber-toothed tiger. Cool. So very basically... Uh, in terms of a, a, a method of relaxing yourself when you're in a stressful time. If you focus on the exhale, so you make an exhale longer than an inhale, mm -hmm. you'll bring your heart rate down and you'll calm down. Right? Yeah. So if you're in a working environment and everything's just getting a bit much, take a step away, do a number of breaths, breathe in for four, breathe out for six, breathe okay. in for four, and that, that sort um, of stuff. So that's, that's where breathwork comes from that's a proven a, medical thing for asthmatics absolutely. as well because yeah, it, yeah. it's, it's more about breathing out yeah, yeah. than it is breathing yeah. in okay so right. where so does music fit in so that that there's a kind of an extensive version of that which is i think it's called tumo breathing but wim hof has made it um famous where you do 30 or 40 massive inhales and, and exhales you saturate yourself with oxygen you're lying down and then you stop and you hold your breath, right? And we've done it in a group environment. I've now done it three times. You do three or four rounds of it, and each time you hold your breath longer. And when we did the last time we did it, we all held our breath for two and a half minutes, which seems insane. Yeah. But you're lying there, and you almost go into sort of a bit of a trance state. Mm. And it helps to reset your brain. And it's, it's, it's proven to be a, a kind of psychological tool that you can use that helps your brain reset a little bit. Rather than psychological proof, does it work for you? Yeah, it did. And that's basically where we come to with this song, <coughs> which is a very nice little segue. Thanks. So I've done this thing three times. Uh, I've had a different experience all three times, uh, all of which relate to my mum and the rubbish that's in my head about her passing away and my guilt for, I guess, letting it happen because it was horrible through lockdown and all that stuff. Mm. But the third time I did it, so first time it was, actually I'll, probably, I'll go into the detail another time, but the, the last time I did it, there's sort of music in the background when you do this in a group. And then there was a song called Follow the Sun by a guy called Xavier Gunn. Uh, and it's a beautiful song. And I bawled my eyes out. And it's quite common at the end of this process to have a, like a massive release, a big release of emotion. And I bawled my eyes out. And then in the group, we were asked to sort of talk about our experience. And Chris 
uh, who's been on before, Chris Wimsurst, he said, so Lee, how was that for you? And I couldn't speak because I was still so emotional about this song. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next day I tried to listen to it and couldn't just because it brought this massive you know, swell of emotion back about my mum. But that's, I don't know, a month ago now. Mm. And now I listen to it and it makes me feel warm and it brings me closer to my, my mum mm. again. And it's, it's a really powerful emotion. <laughs> so just the thought of going through that, it just happened to come up on Spotify the other day. Mm. And I just thought the, the power that songs can have over you in a positive way and sometimes a negative way was an interesting topic, which is why I said, let's talk about music. No, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> if you look at the realities of that song, right, is it the song itself or is it the situation you listen to the song in? Well, I thought originally, because, because obviously there's that build-up of stuff that is intentionally messing with your head in a good way. Mm. And then this song is, is, I guess, helping you to, to process it. I spoke to Chris about it, and the song is very important to him as well. But then I looked the song up on YouTube, and every single comment says, oh, my God, I'm so pleased I found this song. This means so much to me. Right. The... the the basic principle of the song is tomorrow's a new day, right? Yeah. It's about, you know, don't let the world get on top of you. We'll start again tomorrow is the general thing. But it's just, it's beautifully written, beautifully sung. It's just a wonderful song. Can, so, I, can I ask you another question? Is, is it the lyrics you think are resonating with you or is it the actual music? Because <laughs> it's a proven fact. There are certain musical notes that are more uh, pleasing and than than others so um the point case in point um everything i do i do it for you brian adams right yep. that was number one for 370 yep. years right from that film robin hood prince of what's it yeah now the reason it was it was said it was number one for so long is because there's certain phrases in it that your brain loves to hear and there, there was another song by Wet, Wet, Wet. Mm. Mm. And I can't remember which one it was. Love is all around you. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And that was the same. Yeah. Now, obviously, they're the two songs I can think of because that's it. But that's because of the musicality of it rather than the, the words you're listening to. So were you inspired by the lyrics or was it just not that conscious? I think initially, the initial reaction was intentionally, there's, there's sort of nature sounds in the back at the start of the song, there's bird song and stuff in there. And it's kind of bringing you out of this, this sort of trance state that you're in. And then there's a shotgun and then everything's quiet and then, it, then you're happy. Is that, is that where you're going? No, I think, I think it was just, uh, I think it was just... <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Just the, the <coughs> it, I, guess, I guess it helped me get back into my conscious mind and out of this, I keep saying trance, it's not really a trance state, but in this sort of meditative state. Yeah. Whereas since then, because I've then examined the lyrics. It is the lyrics. It says when the world's getting, basically, if the world, when the world's getting too much, get down to the nearest water's edge and, and see where you are in the world and listen to the wind and that sort of stuff. So it's much more about centering yourself and, and going, right, okay, it, yeah, it's all shit. But right. tomorrow Might we go different. again and we start again. So How many songs in your life have you dissected the same way as that song? Uh, consciously, probably none. Exactly, right. So there is something in that song and your situation that resonates in such a positive way yep. that probably unconsciously, you know, you've, you, you know you're, you're, you're subconscious when you're in this trance state or your meditative state takes it all in. Yeah. And also, because you had, even though it was such an emotional reaction, it was a positive emotional yeah, reaction yeah, yeah. because it was a release. Yeah. So your brain equates that song with positivity. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, if yeah. you think about the reality of how powerful that is, so yeah. your whole conscious state is affected by one song. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's another example that's just come into my head. So, as you know, got married um, last May. I was there. You did the lovely job of, of walking my lovely wife into the, to the ceremony, and she came in to I Was Born to Love You, mm. Bloody Mercury. Mm. And I didn't know what she was going to walk into. I was standing there at the, at the front of the congregation for a want of a better word oh congregation and as soon as that song started i welled up just yeah. because it's i was born to love you and she's just been my savior that. has brought me back to life effectively and you know soulmate all of that lovely cuddly stuff hmm. don't be uh, afraid of that that's amazing no, to it's have and that. just and 
and yeah, just just hearing that song and that she thinks I'm that important to sort of declare that through a song as she's coming into the wedding. Mind blown. Yeah, yeah and she does think you're that important. I know. Because well, she's good. told me that. Long may that continue. Which I probably shouldn't have shared with you. But anyway. <laughs> um, the, the funny thing about music is as well, is you also, you have like a, a theme tune to your whole life, don't you? Mm. You know, you, when, my, the first song I have ever bought, right, was yep. Father Abraham and the Smurfs oh. singing Dippity Doo. Excellent. Right? And it goes, let's all sing together, it's singing kind of weather. Yeah. See, I still remember it now, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, now... That, I, <laughs> Have you analysed that in detail as to the psychological effect? That no, but I'll tell you what's odd, mm. okay, for many years until, and in fact it still happens, is at least once a day, you'll sing it. that song will pop into my head, right? And I'm 50 fucking years old, right? <laughs> so for the last 46 years, yeah. I've been going, oh yes, the Smurfs, <laughs> dippity do, dippity da, right? Um, I apologise for the accent, but the man sings like that, right? Don't hate me. Um, so... You know, that's the beginning. The uh, 91 Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, you know, I was a musician, kind of, but that album spoke to me. Yeah. It told me everything I needed to know about the realities of my life, yeah. and I could have the freedom to be angry, I could have the freedom to write songs about things that matter, not just fluff. Yep. And, you know, to this day... I listen to Guns N' Roses. I love Guns N' Roses. We, me and my wife have seen them live. Yep. You know, we, we've seen them twice. One at Hellfest in the rain when we were all smashed. And then once at Tottenham Stadium where we weren't smashed because we couldn't afford any beer because it's nine Cause million it pounds a pint. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's... <coughs> excuse me, coughing. Um, you know, music, being a musician as well, you know, writing... That Perfect Distortion album, if you haven't heard it, you can't hear it, so sorry. Um, I'll, yeah, we'll do something about Yeah, it. I'm sure you can hear yeah. it. Mm. Um, so, writing that, we got into character, me and Rob Clydesdale, who you've seen on the show. Um, and basically, you know, these characters, we wrote the whole album. Right, so let me put, fill you in. Right? Did anyone hear my stomach growling? That Only was a little really bit, loud. You didn't need to bring attention to it. Sorry about that. That's okay. I did, though. Anyway, <laughs> so we wrote, recorded, produced, and output that album in two weeks. Right? I was off my face. Right? So uh, the whole time. But I wrote all of the lyrics. Yeah. Um, Rob was very kind to me. And I decided I was going to play bass in the whole album without actually knowing how to play bass. Excellent. But actually, my bass ideas were used to some extent. And obviously the vocal lines, you know. But that was a complete release for me. Mm. Um, what would really happen was, is I wrote all the lyrics in advance um, for the days we were recording. I would go in there, he would play the music that he did, and then I would be asleep on the sofa because I'd been up all night taking drugs. Um, I was functioning then, yep. but that Perfect Distortion is such a strong album for me, even now. Even though I was broken, it showed the release that I had of my emotions. Do you, so, listen, do you listen to it much? Does it bring back any emotion when you do? Or no. Are you just it, proud of the achievement? I'm proud of it, achievement, yeah. but sadly not many people got to hear it. You know, It's the same as you know, anything. Um, it was put up on Spotify and all of that by uh, our manager who basically just stole all of our stuff and shit on us. Which didn't go well for him, as it turned out. Mm. Um, but legally, I hasten to add, before anyone reads <laughs> into that. Um, so, you know, it's, music is a foundation of my life. Now, you're a musician too, right? Anyone who plays music right, or plays an instrument is a musician. You don't have to go around the world on tour. You've just got to play music because you, yeah. ha you have a different understanding from someone who's never picked up an instrument. Yeah, true. So how does, how, yeah. what's, wh what's the first song you can remember from your life? Um, probably Baggy Trousers by Madness, I guess. I knew it would be Madness with you. Yeah. I don't know why. <clears throat> That's the conversation we had the other day. Yeah. I remember, I remember Madness on Top of the Pops Yeah. Um, for the first time. And also Madness, ska music wasn't Except, no, not accepted. Um, it wasn't everywhere. Ska music wasn't a known entity then. No. Because there was just, um, oh, what are they called? There's Madness and the other one. You've got the specials. The specials. The specials are probably the bigger one. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, you've, got, you've got a whole movement that came in. But, um, you know, Madhouse was like fun. 
funky, showed a positive way of life. Yeah. And you remember that. What music now, if you, if you had to, you know, identify your theme tune now, is there a song apart from the one that you had that would be it, or a band? Because the song's a bit limiting. Um, that's good. Interesting question. I think it depends where I am. And I guess that's the point, doesn't it? It depends what you're doing. If mm. I'm looking at, at training, I mean, I do a lot of gym work and running and stuff. There's a band called Pendulum, who are, I guess their class is drum and bass. Mm. Um, and drum they, and bass rock band. Yeah, they were at um, Download last year. Yeah. And there's all these uh, people looking much like yourself, jumping around like lunatics to drum and bass. And the guy was going drum and bass uh, at Download. What the fuck? Um, but everyone absolutely loved it. So yeah. they're... Don't forget, they had a number one single yeah. in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, J- Pendulum, right, and Rob Zombie and all of that was the... Impetus for us, well, Pendulum's lesser than Rob Zombie and all that, but you know, drum beats, dance drum beats over, you know, underneath a rock band. Yeah. And I love drum and bass. I was, I, I was driving into work the other day, right, listening to Ronnie Size represents, like, you know, brown paper bag, all of that, cause just because it's doom, do 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 which gets you moving. That gets you motivated for the yeah. day. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, uh, there's multiple answers to your question, but in terms of motivation for training, um, something like that. Uh, something fast uh, and furious. Yeah, yeah, but, and I guess the point I want to get across for this, because it's all about 50 and coping, and what do people, you know, what advice can we give to people? And sometimes I think we don't really give advice, we just talk about stuff. Yeah. But one thing I would say is, um, is putting music on, is an is a amazing therapy, right? So if you're feeling down, don't sit there looking in, into your lap, feeling down. Put some music on, particularly music from your childhood, because that will bring you back to a place, uh, hopefully, of joy, or maybe not your childhood, maybe you know, when you got married or whatever, a, a time in your life that is positive, because it will bring those memories back. Um, and when I'm down, I don't do it enough, but when I'm down and when I'm going to go and cook dinner, I'll find some music that is uplifting and it's always stuff that Nicky doesn't like. A lot of the time it's like disco music, so it'll be Barry White or something. And within seconds, I'm dancing around the kitchen and my mood is uplifted mm. right? and all of the stress and the shit of the day has disappeared and I'm down- dancing like I'm in bloody Soul Train or something. Um, mm-hmm. And that shows just the power that it's got. You know, if, if you're tense, find something relaxing. If you're down, find something uplifting. Mm. And it works every time for me. And I don't know if it does for everybody, but you know, music... It's worth really, a try, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, turn that on its head. All right? If you're miserable yep. and you're a bit down, and then you listen to some sombre music that, you know, that reflects your mood, yep. that too doesn't have to exacerbate how bad you're feeling. That can just empathise with you. Yeah, it can, yeah. It can so, still be a comfort. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, you're... Instead of... Because sometimes I find myself, I don't want to change my mood. If there's a reason for being upset or miserable or there's some conflict in my life, because I'm quite a conflict person. I'm quite, I see things in conflict because of yeah. my past. Um, and, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, you're looking for an escape, but the escape just might be empathy from the music you're listening to because then you feel it relates to what you're going through. Yeah. But then also, then there's the upside. You know, if you're, you know, if you're feeling stupid and you're feeling happy, and then you're listening to "Walking on Sunshine" by Katrina and the Waves, then you're dancing around your kitchen because yeah. you haven't got any fucking choice. Yeah, that's the law. Yeah, damn it. Yeah, unless uh, so, ska music. As we, we're coming back to that, mm. there was a guy I used to work with that said that he found uh, ska music depressing, and I don't understand anyone can find ska music depressing. Because it's did he, did he, it's a bit like drum and bass. It's got that. To did me, he it's got expand that. on that? No, they, it, no. I just said no. It isn't. Uh, <laughs> Shut up. But it shows, I guess, that people can interpret the same music in totally different ways, can't they? Maybe, yeah. No. Maybe absolutely. Some, I mean, some. also, he may not have told you that he had a bad situation which revolved around madness. Yeah, maybe. Which so. might not even have been conscious. No, no, no. So no. you know, some girl turned him down at a disco. Yeah. You know, some. Yeah. You know, whatever. I mean, <laughs> the trouble is, is that. Pulling music apart out, out of your everyday life is really difficult. Yeah. Because it's ingrained. Yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, I come in the other day, George is listening to um, some, um, some smooth jazz melodies or something, you know, stuff like that, because that's the mood he was in, yeah. you know. And, and the important thing about music, and there was a guy called Nigel Hayward, who we used to call Paddington because we were young. He was our choir master school, like music teacher at Wells Cathedral School. And he was the one that put us, you know, out there because mm. we could sing and we were pretty good and we went to old people's homes and, and did all that at Christmas. But he said, and it was the most, it's the one piece of advice I've always listened to. He said to me that it doesn't matter whether you like or dislike any type of music, you should listen to all types of music. Yep. Do you, do you have a guilty pleasure that's a bit off track, music genre wise? Uh, <laughs> uh, crikey. No, I would agree with the sentiment um, that you sh should listen to all. I've always kind of resisted jazz. Uh, but in recent years, uh, weirdly, because of putting jazz music on to keep the cats calm when we're not in the house and at firework night and stuff mm. sometimes we come home and this relaxing jazz is on and I'm mm. going this is quite cool isn't it? and I'll happily sit there put a smoking jacket on and and, and yeah get my pipe out and listen to it I'll but yeah so guilty let's, I suppose I ought to try and admit to something but I'll leave that one with me I'll come okay, back, come back to that I'm... okay jazz is, is a great form of expression right so if you want emotive Jazz is it. If you want miserable, the slow, winding trumpets or saxophones and the off-beat drum beats that then kick in and then suddenly find a beat. Yeah, most, or, uh, most drum technicians, drum tutors and stuff that I listen to, it's all about jazz. Yeah. Whether, you, whether you're a rock drummer or you're a reggae drummer or whatever, it's all about, it all comes back to jazz. That's the root of all <coughs> of it, apparently. If, if you're listening, also, then you've got like, is it trad jazz that's just like, you know, like weird notes everywhere, right? Even that can show you how that musician is telling you a story. And they're not, they've got, there's no words. Yeah. And I think that's probably what I've always, <clears throat> what I've always sort of resisted is that, well, that's not, hasn't got a form. Yeah. It's not structured. And I've got a quite a structured brain. So yeah, but that's why I resist it. Now, that's great. That actually proves my point. It's yeah. not structured, no. No. So that proves that music can be completely free of limitations. Yeah. And as songwriter, as a songwriter, I suppose, um, I know and do sometimes write to a formula. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's two verses, then there's a chorus, then there's a verse, then there's a middle eighth, then there's a verse, then it's chorus out. Yeah. Right? Just simply because I write in a rock genre. Yeah. Oh, incidentally, I've done a song about 50 yeah. and Coke. Um, which is with Rob Clydesdale being produced as we speak. Um, my son really likes it. I don't, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so look, where are we at? There, it's not just humans that like music, mm -hmm. right? I have to look at my notes professionally. Yeah. Um, so when you have animals who are stressed, yep. right? Then classical music therapy yeah. for animals. Now, you touched on that just recently with yeah. the jazz for the cats, yeah. right? Okay, the University of Glasgow did a classical music therapy like um, project, yeah. which, and it really did show the calming properties of some classical music. Yeah, well, class Classic FM um, on Fireworks Night, they, intend, they have a show the whole night yeah. that is music for pets, and it works. Um, cause, because it does have relaxing properties and that's basically why when we go out we put some form of classical music or calming music on for the cats and we've got cameras right? Nikki's quite uh, caring about her cats let's say so we've got you know, webcams inside so you can see where the cats are and they are generally chilled when there's music on um, yeah I, well Lily who you know is yeah. my dog who's a nutbag absolutely calms down when you just have the telly on yeah so I make sure that she watches Discovery Channel yeah. and learns how to build off grid and live in Alaska. Excellent. Because quite <laughs> frankly, sometimes I think she should live in bloody Alaska and not in my house. Good skills that all animals yeah. should have. Yeah. I'd really like to live in it. I know mm. this is complete tangent. I'd love to do that just for like a year. Yeah. Go off and live in the snow. I'm going to be cold and all that, but still you get to go and be free anyway. Yeah. What the hell? Mm. Um, so if, if it affects animals and affects us i think you can see again the power of music 
yeah. how it can calm you. It can also turn you into a raving temper. Don't ever drive on a motorway listening to Motorhead. Or oh, the Prodigy, yeah. The Prodigy, yeah. Firestarter, mm-hmm. Overkill. Don't listen to Ace of Spades. I actually got down for speeding once listening to, um, I believe in a thing called Love, because uh, I was singing. Oh, the darkness? Yeah, I was singing so much to it. I, I didn't really see the guy the with the gun and I got pulled over and he said, uh, do you know what you were doing? And I felt like saying, I was singing along to I Believe Anything Would Love, but yeah. I think he meant what speed I was doing. Oh, OK. Uh, did so you say you're the one with the gun, officer? I, said, <laughs> well, I think, I, I don't know, I was probably very, fairly uh, respectful, more respectful than you may have been in that situation. I would have been totally respectful. Yeah. I'd have respectfully told him to shove his gun up his ass. <laughs> um, the Darkness. Now, you see, there you go. Yeah. There's a band what? right from Norwich yeah. in Norfolk. Aye. Where the world is flat. All right. Now they were they caused a huge scene, right? Locally. Yeah. And they grew exponentially. Yeah. Right? And then Radio, I think it was Radio One picked up their single and he sings in falsetto mm-hmm. and normal. Both of them brothers are amazing guitar players. Yeah. And then they stratospherically sold a billion trillion records and then fucked it. So you're high I, and you're doing really well and you're blowing it and then the band exploded. The bass player left. He was like, ah, oh, bollocks. You know, that it all went right up to their head. Nowadays, though, they're amazing. They're back doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. They're supporting huge artists. They're touring themselves around America and Europe. Yeah. Justin Hawkins does uh, 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 like a podcast of his own. I see. Yeah. Justin Hawkins rides again and he looks at different musicians and what he does. Yeah. I like the darkness because yeah. they were a proper... Rags to Riches story. Yeah. I don't know whether they were poor, but, you know, metaphorically speaking. Yeah. It's important. I'm wrong. I'll tell you what else is important, and it proves our point. Um, there is a song... Right, you know I have anxiety, and, uh, uh, and so does everyone, by the way. Yeah. But I have clinical anxiety, which means that it, it can stop you from functioning. Um, there is a song, right, that was um, put into being by, um, right, her name was Liz, spelled L-Y-Z Cooper, and she's part of the British Academy of the Sound Therapy, right? And in conjunction with Radox, Mm. right, they wanted to make a song that consciously was written to calm people down. Okay. Okay, so um, the Marconi Union are British ambient musicians, right? So they hooked up with these people. Um, basically commissioned, they were commissioned, you know, Radox, they do all the like bath singing and some of it's like relaxing your bath and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I use green Radox myself. I used to use green Radox a yeah. long time ago. Very but good. so they've commissioned these guys, right? The ambient, uh, no, they're called, what were they called? Marconi. Oh yeah, the Marconi Union, right? And they, they've done this song and what, what the Marconi Union have done Right? If your body functions can relate to the music, i.e., right, your heart beats around 60 beats per minute, right? And I listened to this last night and took my pulse and it was dead on. Yeah. Right? So the the start of the song is 60 BPM, mirroring heart rates. Yeah. And then during the song itself, it gradually fades down All right. to 50, right? Thus telling your brain, yeah, this is the beat. And it works. It yeah. influences you down. Um, and it, it's... If you're an anxious li- listener, your heart rate will drop because the music drops. And mm. it dictates to you how you're going to be. Yeah. Now, obviously, this isn't a cure-all, but this was scientifically written music. So, by mistake... I mean, you don't have to commission this stuff. Hence, the classical music. You know, yeah. some of Mozart's Fast and Furious, you know, that's going to influence what you do. But a lot of music, um, classical music is swinging and soft yeah, yeah, yeah. and easy to listen to so you know it this is a proven scientific thing yeah so if you want to check that out right then it is called the ambient zone just music cafe that's where it's on volume four and it's called weightless surprisingly excellent by uh the marconi union i just think it's 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 kind of insightful that people are actually writing music to help people now as well yeah, well, it, it clearly has uh, an impact. If you think of the music used in films, right? Very different music <clears throat> from a, a scene in a horror film or a, a thriller film where someone, you know, something tension. Yeah. 
they intentionally put music in the background that increases your feeling of that tension, the impact yeah. that that music can have. Well, or yeah. there's a love story, you know. So yeah. that in itself, it affects you, right? There's there's a there's a, a very distinct connection between your brain and, and your body. So when your brain's tense, your you know your heart rate's going to be mm. going up, and vice versa. So yeah, it makes utter sense. It, it, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? You know, you, I think it's John Williams, isn't it? Who writes all the Star Wars stuff and the big ones and Superman and all that business. Yeah, Hans Zimmer as well. There's yeah. a there's a Hans Zimmer uh, documentary that I ha- I want to try and watch. It's on Maestro, so you have to pay for it, but it looks just fascinating. Um, I think. I think if you, I mean, I have written a body of music directionally, but not for a film. Rob, uh, Rob now does music for television programs. So he's worked on that thing with David Swimmer on Sky TV. He's got another series with Sky TV at the moment. Cool. Um, so you have to be linked to that music, yeah. to that film. But also, I mean, you're going to get a brief from some producer saying, I want the music to do this, 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 this and this with a checklist and a yeah. fucking cloth cap and a whip it probably. But um, not that there's anything wrong with that. But these people who are not artists, they have demands. So yeah. not only can you, you, you don't get to be free with your writing, you have to tick the tick boxes. And oh, I wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah, I think that's a shame. I know someone that became a, a, a composer for Sony and thought he'd made it and then was told to write music that sounds like Adele rather than given the the um the artistic license to write stuff that was good he, mm. oh, well that's popular at the moment we need to write loads of stuff that sounds like that and it destroyed him mm. artistically um was that the guy who went to my school mm, yeah ah. yeah it's it's a strange thing right so when i was 14 so still reasonably, you know, influenced by things. Yep. Um, somebody played me um, The Doors, right? Break on through to the other side, right? Yeah. All of that. And um, I suddenly got fixated on Jim Morrison <coughs> because he had a complete... Fr- he was an alcoholic fuck-up, yep. right? But... You know, some people call him a lyrical genius. Some people call him a shaman. He was involved in all kinds of different things. Massive drug taker, massive drinker, massive smoker. Yeah. Right? But swipe all of that aside, which isn't easy. Look at the lyrics and all of that, right? And then I, I said on some other show about um, going to a friend of mine's house um, when I was really young, and they played a song called Peace Frog by The Doors, which is really banging. It's really insightful in, in about society breaking down. And when you've, got, when you've got that power of influence, I read literally every book ever written, and I read his poetry and all of that. And, you know, the, my father was, like, rolling his eyes, going, well, look, every, every teenager finds you more soon eventually. Mm. But it's <clears throat> that level of connection... Right, I'm a 14-year-old kid. I'm impressionable. I love music. I'm a bit rebellious, you yeah. know, in my head yeah. at that stage. Two years later, that become reality. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then you're in a position where you can totally relate to somebody you don't know. You also don't know what they're really like because, you know, even Danny Sugarman, who was... He met Jim Morrison when he was a teenager and then ended up being the manager of The Doors. Mm. And then it was a hopeless heroin addict and then turned himself around, did all that. You know, him and Iggy Pop lived in a house together. And that's not going to go well, it's is it? It's not going to go well, I wouldn't imagine. No. You know, no, well, Iggy Pop's still alive. Danny Sugarman sadly isn't. He got cancer and died. Um, but when you can... And obviously, right, this is where I'm going, right? It's not all about the music that he wrote with, his, with Ray Manzarek and all the others. It was about him as a human being, right? And I related to some part of him, mm-hmm. right? Motley Crue, I love Motley Crue, but their music's shit, mostly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's not, I mean, it, you know, it's pop music in a rock world, and Nicky Six will tell you he's the best, you know, the best thing in the world. People are even questioning whether he played on his albums. None of that matters. No. Tommy Lee's a nutcase, yep. right? They have lived the Jack Daniels drug lifestyle that I wanted to live but couldn't quite afford to mm. until I did, and then I uh, exploded. But, you know, it's not... The music, I listen to it because it evokes an emotional response. Yep. So... You know, Motley Crue, they're all standing there in their makeup, they're on their leather, they've got birds everywhere, you know, bottles of Jack Daniels, they're emptying a bottle of whiskey every three minutes. 
you know, that film about the doors, uh, Oliver Stone's movie, which was a bit, you know, he was finishing a bottle of whiskey and couldn't get it up, you know, all of that. Um, but it's, it's the people that are behind the music. Mm. Because if you've lived a life of pain, right, and you've, you're a searcher and you, you, you're not ever satisfied with where you're sat, that power comes through in the music that you write. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah, there's another element um, of... We talk about community on this a lot, don't we? Yeah. And I, was, I said to Nicky last night that um, just the process of going to a gig, right? Whenever we go to a gig, it seems to sort of bring us closer together again. Not that there's a problem there, but it... It sort of not that there's it, a problem it there. kind of reinforces our bond. Yeah. And then you're in an environment where obviously there's a there's a uh, two hundred six thousand people there mm. that have all got the same um, adoration of the artists that are in front of you. And then that mm. sense of community is fabulous. Going to download music festival is just amazing. Yeah. Because everyone's there with a common love of music. Yeah. There's between fifty and eighty thousand people all in the same mindset as you. Yeah. And that feeling of community is just phenomenal. Um, yeah, and also all different types of people, all different attitudes, all different wealth levels, yeah. all in the same field, yeah. thinking the same thing. Yeah. Obviously, you get pricks. Right. Yeah, less, I'd say less so at Download than any other music festival I've ever yeah. been to, though, actually. Um, um, I can't. Uh, I went to Download twice. Once I did some radio show thing for Download Radio, which was weird. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, I went to download to see Velvet Revolver. Yeah. Which is, you know, Guns N' Roses without Axel. Yeah. And it had Scott Whelan from um, Stone Temple Pilots singing. And it was a fantastic band. It was a perfect rock and roll band. Um, and basically, I, that was the beginning of my kidney disease then, not that I knew it. So I spent three days in a tent, apart from when Velvet Revolver came on. And I walked all the way around, because you know you camp, and then you've got to walk all the way around. Yeah. And then I sat on the bit at the back just the way watching this amazing rock band and I just for that what hour and hour and 20 minutes hour and a half I just felt better yeah and then I went back and sadly someone had to call an ambulance <laughs> but um it just the power of wanting to see that band yeah. you know you think about it you think about how much tickets cost mm -hmm. and the cost of living nowadays and people struggling but if their band that they love comes, they'll find that money, yeah. which is what makes it slightly heartbreaking that tickets have gone from like 25 quid to 125 It is quid. ridiculous, now. and you can't get them most of the time. Yeah, so absolutely. because, you know, the tickets out, buy them all in bulk, and then yeah. uh, they do that. And they say, oh, well, they can't do that now. No, well, they, well, they they've clearly got, can, yeah. They, you know, they've got 50... <laughs> Three seconds after they go on sale, they're yeah, all out. They've now. got 50 people working for them who all buy 100 each, you know, mm. it's, or 10 each, whatever. It's... <coughs> It's a bit upsetting that, that music, like everything else, has become monetized. Mm. You know, and obviously, yes, musicians. You know, the big rock stars in the day, Led Zeppelin and all that, they're all fabulously wealthy now. Yeah. And they haven't released an album since the 70s yeah. or 80s or whatever. Pardon yeah. me, I don't know the history. You know, but, you know, that's the amount of money they made. People now, they make money. It goes on to Spotify. They have 30 million listeners and they get three pounds. Yeah. You know, and it, it's, you yeah, know... you get like point naught, 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 one of a penny every time someone listens or something. That yeah. It's just ridiculous. You know, and if you're Taylor Swift, right, and you're selling millions of albums and, it, like, you know, people are buying your music, that's great. But if you get popular in your grassroots, you know, there's a couple of my, you know, people, friends of mine who are on Spotify and they've had, like, over a million hits. And everyone assumes that they're, they're dirt yeah. poor. They're, you know, they're driving around in some shitbox, you know, still yeah, trying I mean, to make it. Uh, like so many things, uh, Western culture, whatever that means, and the monetization of stuff has ruined it completely, hasn't it? Yeah. On the pod I was listening to this morning, excuse me if I've got the wrong name, I think it was Sesotho, uh, which is in South Africa, surrounded by South Africa, a little sort of country in the middle of it. This guy went and did some research and sort of eventually got asked to join the tribe singing their songs. Right. And he said, I can't sing. And they couldn't understand the concept of, what do you mean you can't sing? Because it's so embedded in their culture mm. that everyone sings all the time. Um, and he then analysed it and said that the problem is that now we think, well, there's musicians 
that we pay music and we go and pay to go and see and enjoy. Yeah, separation, absolutely. And then there's normal people. Yeah. And they, they literally couldn't understand the concept of what do you mean you can't sing. Yeah, because, because their way of life is the communication of their stories, their history, their everyday life yeah. is sung about. Yeah, and they also said it in their language and in apparently lots of languages, the word for singing is the same as the word for dancing. Yeah. Um, because it's, it is a whole bodily experience. You know, you know where music came from, right? You tell me, monks. Well, no, well, no, oh, maybe. But, you know, music, you know, came about because people needed to celebrate the rock or the sea or the land or the fire. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, they realised they had this instrument, which was their voice. So they would, they would make grunting, singing noises, and then it would come, and then that evolved into, you know, people singing together about things. Then they realised, well, hold on a minute. You know, we've got language, we've got this singing. What we need is something that goes in tune. So, you know, they made a basic whatever. But the point is that from day one, people realised that they could outwardly show their emotions, their feelings, the way that they live, who they are, what their gods did. Yep. And that became the norm. Now, again, loss of community, loss of, loss of the natural flow of things yeah. due to monetization, due to money. Yep. Right now, everyone needs money and I'm not arguing about money, blah, blah. What I am saying now is look at the damage that the money and the commerce and all of that has created. Yep. The damage has been done. You just said it. The separation between musicians and people, right? All musicians are people, usually quite vulnerable people, right? Who have, or, or you know, or overly brash because they're arrogant, Liam, you know, Liam, whatever his name is, Gallagher. Um, but what they all have is an ability, be it in a bedroom or in a stadium, to put something from themselves out. Yep. That's why your mate was destroyed by trying to copy other people's music yeah, because yeah. it wasn't his own emotional outlet. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't got that, what's the point? Yeah. Why do, and also record companies. I mean, that's just so fucking soulless. Right, Adele's sold a billion records and she's some bird from London, right? That's great. Yeah. Copy what she does. It's a formula. Yeah. It's fucking not, is it? Yeah. It's a copy, right? So, you know, the whole point of music, be it... A group musicians, so choirs, orchestras, whatever, be it a tribe yep. or be it me, we all have an output. And it gives us a freedom to sing what you want. You know, comedians, musicians, actors, all these people had a freedom to do what they wanted, all of which has now been closed down and put into a box. Yeah, Because people will say, oh, well, that music's too 80s, it's not about now. What, do you, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so you tell that to Brahms or Mozart, you're, you're Mo yeah, no, that's really 1672 or whatever, I don't know when he was born. But, you know, it's, you know, it's all a bit medieval, all that loop playing, no, it's bollocks, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's where bloody the Les Paul came from, son. Yeah. I'm getting a bit airy at you now. Yeah, a little bit, that's okay. You need to listen to some calming music. <coughs> I need to cough, is mm. what I need to do. I apologise, I seem to have a frog in my throat. Um, it would be interesting to know what you guys think about music and also... Is there one song from you lot? Is there one song that drove you in a certain direction? So you needed inspiration. You just needed to get to work on time and you were late. You, you know, you need to get out of bed because you couldn't be bothered. Is there something that drives you? Is there a set of music that gives you what you need to get through the day? If you go onto Instagram, go to Jim Distortion, you will find my page with the show. Message me on there or... 50 and coping at gmail.com email us um, at some point there will be some kind of website because I'm feeling the necessity Ooh. of it okay because I, I feel like we're communicating with with people all the time you know people are leaving messages and all of that now I did say promise that we go through messages today but we won't because we have to do it next time I'm sorry about that um, we are seeming to find that everything negatively be it music be it whatever is is boiling down to a loss of loss of freedom is it through commerce through dictated rules certainly a loss of creativity yeah yeah 
And it, if you lose creativity, then we all just become robots. Yeah. And then there is no new music. There is no, you know, n new things. A, a case in point, right? Gaz Coombs. Do you know, right? I do. Right, lead singer of uh, Supercross. Yeah. He released an album recently um, that he made during the whole COVID thing, which we don't talk about because it's boring. Um, and everyone expected it to be Supercross. And, and there were things of it. But the whole album's amazing, mm. right? And I, I like Supergrass, but you know, I'm not a super fan, right? But there are songs on there that are truly emotive, that you can see what's going on with him. And, and it's in a different style. Yeah, he's a singer and he plays guitar and does all that. But my point is, you know, when you pigeonhole people, yeah, they're not going to write the same song over and over again. Guns N' Roses are never going to write Sweet Child of Mine again or Paradise mm. City or any of that. And their new music, right, this is telling of me. They've made some new music now, right? Yep, yep. I haven't listened to any of it. I, same for me with Madness. I, I don't... They, they've tried in more recent years to get back to the basic stuff, but for me, Madness's albums steadily got worse, in inverted commas, because they were trying to become too artistic. They'd lost, they'd lost the kind of... the rawness of the stuff that they right, created. Right, that's stuff. interesting. Hold that thought. OK. Have they lost it? Or were they trying to expand? Were they trying? I think they were to trying to expand, but I think right. they they were potentially trying to expand uh, beyond their capability, with with respect. Okay. Um, do you know what I mean? I think they were trying to become musos, when actually what what the the, the reason people liked them was the, was the basic grassroots scale. Okay, stuff. right. Turn that on its head. Yep. Your perception of their music on that and commercial success, right, shows that you wanted the original form of Madhouse. Madness. M Madness Madhouse. Yes. Oh, hello. Where'd you get that from? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so is it, is it safe to say that maybe music perception by the crowd, by the listeners, <clears throat> should influence the music people make? Uh, no, I guess not. I mean, yeah, we all want to improve and, and, and adapt and change, don't we? Yeah, but um, I, I'm, I'm reaching for a point I'm not getting to, I think. It should, should you write... So, Oasis, all of their stuff, same kind of game, right? Yeah. Very popular, Field Nebworth, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Right? But then they went off and did their own thing, and Liam very much stayed in the same part, but proved he was a songwriter. Noel, uh, you know, tried to get away from the four chord songs and said, I've never been a chord songwriter. It's like, well, you have, son. Mm. But, you know, when you, when the audience's perception of what you're making changes, yeah. you're always going to strive to go back to what you used to do. Yeah. That's not right. Just to be... Well, if, if yeah, if that's driven by commercial success. Yeah, the whole thing's people-pleasing, but also you're pleasing some suit in an office to make money. Yeah. And I think that's where, that's where people like Axel Rose, and, you know, he did that, the Chinese democracy, right? And that's a polar, you either love it or hate it. I happen to love it. But it wasn't Guns N' Roses. That was, that was Axel Rose, mm. right? But, you know, I think the point I'm making is that if, you, if everything needs to sound the same because everyone thinks there's a formula for this, yeah, there is a formula for writing music. Yeah. yeah, musicians go into a room, write down some words, use some chords they like as a basis thing, and then they twiddle over the top of it and make it flesh it out. Yeah, you know, Trent Reznor as well. You tell Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, that he's got a right to a formula, I'll tell you exactly what he'll tell you to do. Mm. You know, and so he should. Josh Homm from uh, Queens of the Stone Age, yeah. you know, all Queens of the Stone Age albums, yeah, all right, they're guitar band and all that, but they're different songs. Mm. And especially the last album, because obviously he, he had cancer and didn't tell anybody and was getting through. And also Brody Dahl was accusing him of all kinds of terrible things that he didn't do. Um, you know, we get involved with musicians' lives. Yeah. I mean, I am totally guilty of this. I've told you, I, you know, Motley Crue, I love them, but their music is not great. Yeah. And that's not why. I, I am enamoured by this lifestyle of the people involved in them. So it's not just the music. No. It's the people behind it. But, saying that again, if you take music face value, yeah. then it can influence your heart rate. Yeah. It can influence your anxiety state. It can make you feel differently. Yeah. I've got one. I, I need to come back to your question earlier of my guilty pleasure. Go. <laughs> what I've been thinking, I've come up with an answer, which I think is also inspirational to why I became a drummer. 
right? If we're talking guilty pleasure of cheesy music, mm. Easy Lover by Phil Collins and Phil Bailey. He's a greasy lover. Oh, my God. I, I absolutely love. So when that comes on, obviously, I'm air drumming whenever right. it comes on. Let me tell you. But I think that's possibly one of the songs that made me want to become a drummer. We used to sing, he's a greasy glover. Yeah. Because um, we used to do that as a cover song. Oh, God. I, I love Genesis, right? Phil Collins' Genesis, Invisible yeah. Touch, right? Because, age 13, I was in a place called Lozère, which is a suburb of Paris, yeah. very, being very 13 and pissed off that I was going to art galleries and looking at fucking culture. <laughs> oh, God. Do you not realise I'm 13? Yeah. Anyway, and then, and then I stood on the train with my whole family around me going, well, yeah, I don't know why I have to speak fucking French. All the French can speak English. Yeah, See, I was a bit of a shitbag. Yeah. Right? But the one... So, uh, it was a tape. The one tape I brought with me was Invisible Touch by Genesis. Mm. I can sing all of it. Yeah. <laughs> right? And I love it. Also, Phil Collins and Chester Thompson drumming together. Right? Do you know who Chester Thompson is? Uh, no. Okay, right. He basically, when Phil Collins gets up to sing, right off his kit, or he doesn't now. He, no, he can't play, I'd say. Sadly. Get well, Phil. Um, when he comes off the kit sing, Chester Thompson oh, see. He, is the drummer, right. right? They do the dual drumming thing. Oh. Yeah. Go onto YouTube, look up flipping uh, Phil Collins and Chester Thompson, right? Drum dueling, I yeah. imagine it's called. Yeah. It's fantastic. I never thought I would be on my own podcast talking about how much I love Phil Collins. <laughs> well, there you go. You bastard. <laughs> Right, listen, we have run out of time completely. Listen, I'll tell you what you do. Underneath, in the doobly-doo, right, where the comments are, can you please write what your favourite song is and just a couple of words why, OK? I'm sticking my neck out because nobody will do it because the internet's a f place of darkness. Mm. But let's have some light. Tell me your favourite song, right, and what the reason is. Put it there or Jim Distortion on Instagram. Come and find us. Come and join in. Yeah. 15 coping, we'll see you next time.